Okay, uh, welcome to our um, March monthly meeting. Uh, it's so great to see all of you tonight. Uh, I hope you've been able to get out and see the uh, beginning of, of early spring birds that are out there. Uh, all of the birds beginning to uh, 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 get ready for breeding, breeding season, the songbirds singing atop of trees, birds pairing off everywhere you go. Um, the swallowtail kites have arrived in the area. Hopefully you'll get to see them uh, soon. Uh, the, um, um, the purple martins are back and they're already occupying many of the purple martin houses that Audubon Everglades has helped install or has installed throughout the country. So this is a great time to get out there, folks. Get out and start seeing birds. Um, let's go. So some news and special announcements. Uh, the March kite is very robust again. Uh, we have a plant of the month, the Corky, Corky Stem Passion Vine, uh, uh, which is, uh, of course, attracts our um, Florida uh, butterfly, which is the, trying to remember. Uh, Mary, tell me quick. Alan, Alan help. <laughs> <laughs> the zebra long wing. Zebra long wing, thank you, Alan. <laughs> And the, and the golf fertility also, which is not, of course, a Florida butterfly, but it's another uh, butterfly that it does attract. And we have an article on our vanishing birds, uh, which will be also monthly. This week it features the, our, our, our uh, chapter symbol, the Everglades snail kite. Uh, we have an article on our featured speaker, who some of you got to meet earlier, Dr. Rindy Anderson, and who you'll be hearing later. Our bird of the month, the Swainson's warbler, which, with, uh, which Chuck and Cece will be telling us all about soon. We have a profile on new board member, Robert Franzino, who we are delighted to have on the board. And we have a wonderful article on Welcome Home Purple Martins by Shelley Rosenberg, who I think is on here, uh, with, that I'm sure you'll enjoy. And it'll, it'll, it'll inform you about all the uh, things that are going on with Purple Martins. And uh, the President's Corner is returning for its second month. I, uh, I think you'll learn a lot about what's going on in the club there. And uh, program opportunities on March 18th. Uh, there is a link in the uh, kite for this. There is a wonderful program on invasive rep large reptiles that I think you'll find fascinating. I'll also be sending out an email about this. So you'll receive additional news on how to sign up and learn more about these invasive reptiles, who to call when you see them, how to identify them, and how we can hopefully get, get these under control to help our uh, wildlife, particularly our birds, which these reptiles can be terrible nest predators of. We have a book discussion group uh, starting in April 13th. Uh, again, that's in my president's corner and I'll be sending out a email about that as well. We are excited, this is a new opportunity. Uh, the AE Photography Club has a couple of programs coming up. One is Avian Jewels, how to photograph warblers. Uh, Clive, which of course Clive will be discussing one of those warblers. And we're gonna open up this photography workshop to everyone because as of April 1st, all the photography programs will be now open to everyone in the club. Everyone who's in the club can enjoy the photography club programs, can participate in them, can, can participate in the photography field trips and workshops and round tables. We are very excited to have everyone be part of the photography club if they want to be. Uh, and also on March 22nd, there'll be a workshop on camera and gear, question and answer. So if you have questions about your camera and gear, that's a good time for that. Our next meeting uh, is April 6th and our speaker, very exciting, will be Ron McGill, who is a wonderful speaker. I'm sure some of you have heard him speak before uh, of, the, of Zoom Miami and it will be on protecting the Harpy Eagle which is, I think, the largest eagle in North, uh, in, excuse me, in the Americas, not in North America, and one of the, I think, one of the three largest eagles in the entire world. So you'll be excited to hear about the harpy eagle, what the, and what they're doing to protect it. So field trips, unfortunately, are still canceled. We're still in COVID shutdown, flock shutdown. So please get out there on your own and see some wonderful birds. Uh, and now, uh, Mary, uh, my wife is here, and who's also the chair of the nominating committee, 
and she'll be presenting the Audubon Everglades Board for 2021. Uh, this is the nominating slate, and she'll be telling you all about them. Hi there. Uh, I'd like to, first of all, thank our volunteers who helped me uh, on the nominating committee. That's Paul Davis and Charlene Raphael. And the slate that we're presenting tonight will also be in the April issue of the Kite newsletter. And then it will be voted on at our monthly meeting on April 6th. So this, the Audubon Everglades Board for 2021 nominating slate is President Scott Zucker, um, <laughs> first vice president Sabina Begg, and then the board of directors uh, are Debbie Smith, Mary Young, me, um, Robert Franzino, Lauren Butcher, Natasha Warwick, Marianne Gable, Susan Kennedy, and Michelle Bashoon. And just so you know, um, we have two executive positions that are not up for re-election this year because we've started to stagger them so that they're not all in the same uh, at the same time. And they are a recording secretary who is Kathy Hansen and our treasurer who is Luann Dillon, who you'll be seeing next. Thank you so much. And we hope, uh, I'm gonna be asking, we'll see how many can make it at, uh, of the new board uh, members uh, to appear at the April meeting. And we'll introduce them to you so you can get to see who your Audubon Everglades all volunteer board is. And we're delighted uh, of, of the work of the nominating committee. They did an incredible job. I know how hard they worked because Mary has been working right beside me. Uh, and so I've seen the time that she has been put in, putting in to put this incredible board together. Just so you know, Scott, the slides have not been advancing. Oh, that you're not seeing that slide? We're seeing the news and social announcements. Oh uh, my goodness, okay. Slide one. okay. All right, uh, so, so can you now see the nominating slide? Yes. Okay, I'm not sure why there's this disconnect right now, but I see what's going on. Okay, uh, so uh, here is the uh, slide that Mary was talking about. And just so you know, uh, uh, part of the slate of course is from 21 to 23. And then the other parts in 21 to 22, so it's a one year term. And then the following time, if those, if those members are up for re-election, they will be on a two year term. So we are again, trying to stagger the slate so that we no longer have all of our board members coming or going at one time so that we at least can have half the board there whenever we have a new election every year. So now, uh, uh, our proposed uh, 2022 Audubon Everglades budget, and I give you our fabulous treasurer, uh, Luann Dillon, to tell you all about it. Luann? Uh, you might want to unmute yourself, Luann. And Scott, if you'd like to use presentation mode. Okay, I, I thought that's what it was already in. I'm not sure why that's not working because it's, okay. I'm seeing it actually on my computer. I don't know what the disconnect is. I'm, I'm, I, and I apologize for it. So are you still not seeing presentation mode? Okay. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm fine, I'm sorry. Slide, but can you hear me now? Yes, Luann, we can hear you. Okay, okay sorry. Um, okay, I'm going to just briefly go over our budget. Also, um, will be voted on um, during the, um, April, the April general meeting. Um, so uh, first, we'll talk about uh, the income section. Um, as you can see from this uh, proposed budget slide, most of our income comes from our friends of Audubon Everglades membership, as well as donations. And um, also some, we get some money from uh, National Audubon. This has been a very unusual year in that a lot of our um, planned projects for the current year, which ends on March 31st, had to be canceled due to uh, the coronavirus. 
And so we do have, um, you know, a big, what well, we do have almost $9,000 from the money that um, um, we received this year to, um, to carry over into continuing our projects next year. So our total income for next year um, is projected to be over 38,000, as you can see on the slide. Um, uh, on the expense side, we divide it into like three different categories. The first of which is the administration that includes things like um, our insurance, um, licenses that we have to pay to the state, um, things like our PayPal fees, um, our accountant and storage. Um, the one thing that you'll notice is different from prior year is that um, we will no longer be printing the annual report, which is what, uh, which is the a mailing that we you, you usually would receive in March that contained the proposed budget and the slate of um, directors to be um, voted on. So from now on, that will only be shown on the website. The biggest portion of our expenses has to do with our program. That includes the brochure that we send out every August that shows our field trips as well as our, um, our general meeting. Um, right now, we still do not know for this year whether we're going to be able to, when we'll be able to have um, field trips or in-person meetings. Um, but we did put money in the budget to send out a brochure again, but we um, anticipate that it'll be an abbreviated brochure. Um, so this category also includes our, our projects supporting burrowing owls, um, uh, uh, the Christmas bird count. Um, the money there is a little bit um, larger than it has been in the past. We um, intend to um, hold a compilation dinner for um, all the volunteers as well as um, uh, provide money so that there can be um, uh, um, pelagic, um, we can send somebody out on a pelagic boat or also have boats in the Lake Worth Lagoon to like increase the area that we cover. Um, it also includes communications, which is all the, um, the Zoom, the constant contact, all the ways that we get in touch with members. Um, uh, okay. The, okay. I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, okay. So the so this category also includes our our monthly meetings, the all the any expenses related to photo club, which as Scott mentioned before, will now be open to everyone. Um, we also give a, a grant uh, uh, to uh, the Everglades Day, which is sponsored by um, you know by Loxahatchee. Um, hopefully that will be held again next year, um, as well as our programs for Plants for Birds and um, Purple Martins. Go ahead. Um, our final category is education. Um, so we do fund um, for our board members to go to um, the Audubon, the Florida Audubon um, Assembly, which is normally held in the fall. Um, we also, this also has the expense side of the conservation class, which hopefully we will also uh, be able to have again next year. Um, we send our um, conservation chairs to the Everglades Coalition Con Conference. Um, and this category also includes like all the festivals, all the public festivals um, that we, that, you know, we go out into the community and um, uh, like, um, I don't know, the ones I'm thinking of are like the Gumbo Limbo Day, where we actually have, we have a booth there and we have activities for children. We provide activities that we give out handouts. Um, we also sponsor a, uh, an award for part of the Palm Beach County Green School Program. And um, we also help fund things at the, um, the um, ornithological collection at the West Palm Beach branch of the Palm Beach County Library, which has like an amazing collection there. And like our last project was those backpacks for um, those birding backpacks that um, 
kids can check out and they have everything needed, a guidebook, binoculars and everything. That was something that we did in partnership with the library. Um, and then our, we have a few other expenses that um, we, okay, first we have, um, we've received grants for the, during the last two years that um, are going to go towards the demonstration um, garden at Pine Jog, the native plants. Um, so we've received that money, but we have not spent it yet. So that will be spent shortly as they um, go ahead with the actual installation of that garden. We are also lucky enough to have um, uh, a, a, a large bequest, which, you are, which we are spending a certain amount each year. So this year, our programs that are being funded from that are um, uh, two new brochures, um, that we're going to develop one is plants for birds and the other one is common birds of Palm Beach County and um, the other uh, initiative is going to be a new program that we have where we will give small like $500 grants to people that are that are doing um, that are doing things that are related to um, birds and um, and their habitat for example if, like for example student at FAU is doing um, funding is doing a survey of burrowing owls. If she needed funding, she could um, apply for one of these grants from us and we could help fund her project. Um, so our, our total expenses will come out to the 48,000, which includes that 10,000 that are funded from, not from our current operating income. Um, so if people have any questions, they can put them in the chat box or they can also email me at uh, treasurer at Audubon Everglades. Um, thank you. Thank you, Luann, and thank you, Mary. If you have questions for either, uh, you can put those questions in the chat, or again, you can email them uh, both. Uh, and both their emails are available on the website, and Luann, we just told you hers, treasurer at audubonEverglades.org. And Mary, yours is? Oh, it's, uh, it's conservation at audubonneverglades.org. So uh, you could email either one of them. Okay, thank you so much. So uh, just some quick conservation news. Uh, the Florida legislative session starts tomorrow. Oh my God, let's hope they do a good job this year. Uh, if you want to get more in touch with some of the issues and take action, a real easy place to do that is through the Florida uh, Conservation Voters. Uh, this is their website. This is their action page. You can see right here all the possible actions that you can take. Uh, these are just some of them, and more will be coming on as well. And they'll also tell you some of the important issues there. They'll tell you how you can find your legislatures. So a great place to look and be able to take action is at the Florida Conservation Voters website. And Audubon Everglades will also be sending out action alerts through its conservation email uh, and if you are signed up for that, you'll receive uh, conservation news and conservation uh, action alerts from us. So uh, volunteer opportunities, we're looking for all of the technical support we can get. And as you can see by my uh, uh, effort tonight, we need it badly. So if you have some technical skills, uh, whether they're web skills or whether they're uh, skills in terms of um, using social media. We are expanding all of our social media platforms and adding even more of them. We hope to be on three to four different social media platforms. Our, our goal is to be able to get the news out and information out uh, and to you, our members, in every way possible and to the public, of course, in every way possible. So if you have any technical support in any of these areas, uh, at audubonneverglades.org, or if you just like to volunteer in any other capacity to be with the organization, remember, we are an all volunteer organization. Everyone here is doing it for the love of birds, for the love of nature, for the love of conservation, for the love of inspiring others about nature and teaching others about uh, birds and conservation. So please join us in our effort to uh, make Audubon Everglades the best and most exciting club we can make it. Uh, questions, so if you have questions tonight, for either of our two speakers, uh, uh, for Clive or for uh, Rindy Anderson, Dr. Rindy Anderson, please put them in the chat area. 
and I will be reading those questions and Dr. Anderson and Clive will be answering them. Uh, so be sure you, you put your questions there. Okay, it's time for me to get off the screen and shut up and introduce our first presenter, uh, Clive and Cece uh, Pinnock for the bird of the month. And it's a wonderful little bird that you're gonna see. Clive, it's all yours. Uh, and if you want to, you can share your screen. I will stop sharing mine or I'll try to. I'll stop sharing. Okay, Clive, share your screen and be sure you turn your mic on. Okay. We can see your screen, Clive. Okay, great. Okay, very good. All right. Well, we uh, want to start out again by uh, just saying that we are continuing with our 2021 Bird of the Month series by focusing on uh, North American species requested by our Audubon Everglades members. Uh, as usual, each month, uh, information on the featured species will cover its description, range, habitat, food, and reproduction. Okay, um, let's see here. All right, our bird of the month this month is the Swainson's warbler. And uh, this particular species was requested by Chuck Ignite. And uh, we wanna thank you, Chuck. Um, at the end of the presentation, uh, we'll also give our members uh, additional opportunities, should you like to do so, to request additional species, because we do have um, uh, more than uh, 12 for this year, so that we can carry over into next year, if you guys would like to be able for us to continue along this trend. So we'll give you uh, uh, the information at the end of my presentation. Okay, the bird, uh, obviously, as you see there in front of you, it's uh, slightly dis described as a little unusual for warblers in that it's a pretty stocky, heavy built type of bird. The beak is unusually long. And unlike most warblers that are quite vibrant in colors, this one is pretty cryptic, especially in regards to the habitat that the bird uh, um, uh, lives in. Um, more times than not, you will actually in the breeding season hear the male singing, but very, very rarely will anyone ever get a chance to actually see the bird because they are so secretive. Um, as you can see there, the uh, dorsal or upper portion of the bird is more of an olive brown color. Uh, the ventral or the, air, the belly area is uh, more of a um, off-white uh, to gray in color, and again, making the bird extremely cryptic uh, in coloration. There is no real strong sexual dimorphism between male and female, although the liter literature does state that in the males during the breeding season, the crown uh, actually reflects more of a chestnut color than the uh, brown that we see there. Okay, the uh, um, range that this bird usually uh, exhibits or inhabits is uh, the southeastern uh, region of the United States. And uh, they are actually being discovered uh, more in, uh, uh, sometimes in Eastern Colorado, but this uh, particular map here shows into uh, Eastern Texas. Uh, some of the literature that I've looked through have actually stated that they've been found in uh, um, Eastern Colorado, as well as uh, some in Mexico as well. But we can see here that the breeding range extends um, in the Southeastern United States. Uh, the habitat is usually that of uh, giant cane forests, but also swampy uh, forested areas uh, in the Appalachian Mountains, uh, usually in uh, um, uh, ravine areas in mountain ravine areas. And the one common feature that is found in the uh, habitats 
that this species frequents is a very dense canopy and very dense understory with very heavy leaf litter. Um, and you can now see why when we looked at the bird uh, in the earlier slide, uh, why it is so advantageous for the bird uh, because it blends into that particular ecosystem really, really well, making it very, very difficult to see. Um, here's a schematic of uh, what the species looks like. And as I mentioned before, there's no real strong sexual dimorphism uh, between adult male and female, uh, but there is a slight uh, variation in the juvenile bird, uh, more of an olive uh, greenish or to gray back and that buffy off-white breast area. And we also see part of the schematic there, the bird in flight. Okay, I mentioned before about the fact that they like dense understory with thick can canopy. Uh, these birds, um, these warblers, unlike most other warbler species, uh, tend to walk around on the ground leaf litter using that heavy beak to actually turn leaves over. And they feast on a variety of invertebrates, insects, uh, centipedes, millipedes, and spiders that reside under that leaf litter. They generally walk around pretty slowly, uh, flipping through the leaf litter. And unlike um, a couple of different species that would scratch, these guys strictly use their beaks to do so. Again, unlike other warblers that might flit around in the understory from branch to branch, these tend to focus most of their activity on the ground, working through that leaf litter to uh, forage for uh, the prey that they're looking for. Um, during the nesting season, which takes place in the spring, once the males arrive on the nesting sites, they actually establish uh, very large territories. I was quite surprised to see in the literature that sometimes the territories can extend to as much as 45 acres and one busy male because the males are extremely territorial and they spend a lot of time, especially in the initial stages of setting up the territory, they spend a lot of time chasing uh, rivals out of the territory. They will use song um, and uh, displays to uh, communicate with uh, potential rivals, but they also will use songs and displays to attract potential females. Um, generally, uh, the pairs tend to be monogamous. However, there are times that researchers have found a little bit of polygyny involved where there's one male copulating with several females. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, uh, the nest um, adds quite a bit to the uh, whole cryptic uh, behavior of the bird uh, because we, um, Celicia was able to find some really great photographs showing how cryptic that nest is, making it very difficult to locate not only the bird, but the nest itself. Uh, the uh, outside of the nest um, is littered with a lot of the leaves that you would normally find uh, in the leaf litter on the forest floor, but the uh, cup uh, in which the eggs are laid is actually very well made, uh, made of uh, um, pine needles, hair, uh, Spanish moss, um, uh, feathers, uh, soft uh, plant material. Uh, that they were, they are able to use to um, uh, line that uh, the nest. Generally, uh, eggs um, number anywhere from three to seven. Uh, they can have, uh, on average, two to five, but it's usually three uh, that's in the nest. We're seeing a nest there in the middle bottom with four eggs, and of course, the right of that, we've got four chicks. Um, the female is the only one that actually builds the nest. However, once the nest is made and she lays the eggs, um, she incubates those eggs for about 13 to 15 days. And uh, when she takes breaks from incubation, the male actually provides her with food, but he never feeds her while she's actually incubating the eggs. He always waits until she leaves the nest 
before he feeds her. Incubation, again, is 13 to 15 days. The young are altricial in their phase. In other words, they, uh, when they're hatched, they're basically pretty helpless, blind, naked, and uh, uh, they remain in the nest under the care of both parents for about 10 to 12 days. At that point, the young will vacate the nest and continue to be cared for by both parents for about the next two to three weeks, okay? Um, and uh, uh, basically um, that is the information that we uh, wanted to provide regarding our Swainson's warbler. Uh, uh, at the bottom of this slide, I mentioned earlier that because we do have some extra uh, bird species that were requested by our members, we um, will be able to, should the uh, membership uh, desires that, we will continue this particular um, approach to our bird of the month by looking at overall North American species. And we will focus on those that are requested by you, our members. We're very, very pleased uh, in the response that we've had so far. And we're pretty excited in doing the research to produce uh, this information for all of you. So uh, Scott, if you have any questions, we are more than ready to field those for you. Okay, uh, are there any questions for Clive? I'm looking in the chat right now. And so far, I don't see any questions. I'll give you guys a minute to get your fingers uh, loose and stretch them out a little bit and maybe type in some questions for Clive because this warbler is one of the most elusive warblers even when they're around, they are hard to see. Okay, so uh, first, a couple of questions are coming in. So uh, uh, Barry Bryan asks, where can we see this warbler around Palm Beach County? This, that's a pretty tough question for me, um, considering that uh, the bird would be a lifer for me. And I've, uh, I've birded a lot of mm. Palm Beach County uh, every year since I've moved to Florida. And I'm yet, I've yet to see this bird. So, um, if anyone else in the audience can uh, answer that, uh, that would actually help me. Um, Scott, you and I were communicating earlier this afternoon and you gave me a couple of possibilities uh, and I'll be heading out to look for that bird. So I was telling Clyde that one of the play, I've seen this bird only twice in my life and both times I saw it at the uh, Lantana Nature uh, uh, Preserve. And that's because it was, uh, listed as an, on uh, eBird. And somebody else, Susan Young, who's a, one of our field trip leaders and, a, and an excellent birder, uh, uh, is saying Spanish River is a good place to find them as well. So two places, Lantana Nature Preserve and Spanish River down in Boca are two excellent places to possibly, if you're so lucky, find this bird. I mean, it's typically, as Clive said, on the ground, under brush, um, it blends in perfectly, uh, and if you get a look, get a good look as quick as you can because it usually doesn't last. Mm. And that one picture I know that Clive had of it on a branch, I have never seen it off the ground. <laughs> so I, I would love to see it on a branch. All right, uh, so we have another question. Do they nest on the ground or in the trees, Clive? This is asked they, by Chris Golia. Uh, Chris, they actually nest off the ground usually within um, uh, about four feet on average above the ground. And it's usually in, again, very dense vegetation and predominantly where there are a lot of vines like catbriar and grape and things of that sort. And as you could see from the photos that uh, we showed earlier, uh, the external portion of the nest blends in so well in that uh, habitat combination that it makes it almost impossible to locate the nest as well as the bird. Okay, and, and Clyde, this is gonna challenge you a little bit. Chris at also asks, uh, can you play their song for us, Clive? Uh, my technical advisor is in the process of doing that for you. <laughs> if you give us a quick second, we can do that for you. And afterwards, maybe a Dr. Anderson can tell us what the song means. No, I'm kidding. I won't put you on a spot like that. <laughs>
All right, here we go. <laughs> and as you might imagine, if you're in uh, the type of habitat that this bird uh, exists in, um, sound uh, plays tricks on you. Uh, there is some ventriloquial properties to that song, and it makes it hard to locate the bird. As I mentioned before, if you're familiar with the song of the bird, uh, that's basically the easiest way to determine if the bird is actually even present because it's so hard to see it. Uh, Clive, can you define ventriloquial? Ventriloquial refers to uh, uh, their ability to communicate. Uh, they're singing, they're communicating through song, and there are times that the pitches within their um, vocalization is so high that it's difficult to pinpoint the actual location through uh, from which the, the sound is coming. So quite often birds will use this in particular uh, in communicating to other species when there's a hawk or another predatory bird around, they will actually make these high pitched uh, calls that is hard to localize, but other species uh, um, will actually be able to recognize that call and they get very, very quiet until the danger passes. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you so much for that great explanation. Uh, Chris Murtaugh says, great presentation, Clive. Uh, Chris Golia uh, for playing the song says, way to go, Cece. She's complimenting Cece. <laughs> <laughs> and saying such a sweet song. And I agree, that was sweet. Very high pitched though, but really yeah. sweet. And Lauren Butcher says thank you as well, Clive. You're so, very welcome. We're much both. appreciated. We look forward to the surprise bird for next month because Clive will not tell us in advance anymore. No, we won't. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but we, but it's it kind of makes it more exciting, I think. Right. So uh, tune in next month for the bird of the month, and you'll find out then, or just maybe the day before in the uh, in the kite, <laughs> what that bird is. Looking forward to it, Clive. And CC, thank you so much for a great presentation. You're um, welcome. Take care. Bye. Okay, uh, let's see. Okay, uh, so you should be seeing my screen, I hope. Uh, so our featured program tonight is Dr. Rindy Anderson. And you see some great pictures of her there. One with some sounds like sound equipment and the other, of course, uh, holding a Bachman Sparrow, I think. Okay, so Dr. Rindy Anderson, most of us love listening to the vocalizations of birds. In my 20, I found that their songs gave me some solace in the midst of the noise of New York City where I was raised. To tell us more about bird vocalizations, tonight's speaker, Dr. Rindy Anderson is backed by popular demand to continue sharing her research about what exactly makes bird songs so special and why scientists study them. Many of Dr. Anderson's authored or co-authored 32 publications seek to answer the questions, why do birds sing? Here are just a couple of her fascinating publications. Quiet threats, soft songs as an aggressive signal in birds. Here's another, song type sharing and territory tenure in Eastern Song Sparrows, Implications for Evolution of Song Repertoires. And there are many more fascinating titles as well. A behavior ecologist and assistant professor at Florida Atlantic University, Dr. Anderson developed her love of songbird and field ornithology while earning her PhD in biology at the University of Miami. She honed her skills in bioacoustic analysis and animal cognition testing while doing postdoctoral work at Duke University. She has a BS in zoology from Arizona, Arizona State University and an MS in marine science from the University of San Diego. Dr. Anderson and her students study the behavioral ecology of songbirds, focusing on social behavior, 
acoustic communication and cognition in their FAU lab. One of her fascinating ongoing projects is at Jonathan Dickerson State Park, where they study the structure and function of female song in the secretive and shy Bachman Sparrow, a bird that I have only seen at Dupuis Management Area at the northwestern tip of Palm Beach County. Additionally, her lab also studies the song of the more common but beautiful Northern Cardinal in the, in the Broward County Parks. Dr. Anderson must be a wonderful professor as she is beloved and admired by her students. On the website, Rate Your Professor, she currently has a 4.7 out of five rating. That is a 94% score. Not too shabby, Dr. Anderson. Here are just a few of the comments her students shared. I cannot say enough kind things about Dr. Anderson. She is the reason I got involved in research with FAU after taking her class. And to Dr. Anderson's comparative animal biology, excuse me, and Dr. Anderson's comparative animal behavior is the best course I've taken at FAU. She is an incredibly fun and engaging professor, even in a lecture hall filled with 120 plus students. And finally, she is amazing. I had to say that loud because that was in all bold, bold caps. Uh, she is the nicest professor I have ever had. Super involved with her students and she actually makes annual, animal behavior very interesting. Many of us had that same impression of Dr. Anderson after her first presentation in December, 2019. And I'm sure that we will be equally engaged and amazed by her this evening. Now, please feel free to extend your arms out a bit and applaud in your living rooms, bedrooms, kitchens, or wherever you are watching this Zoom cast from as Audubon Everglades welcomes Dr. Rindy Anderson to present on a screen near you, the science of animal behavior, why birds sing and why we study them part Two. Dr. Anderson. Wow, <laughs> that was quite an introduction. I feel like I don't need to give the talk now. I feel like <laughs> that was the talk. <laughs> All right, so I will share my screen. Okay. So, um, Last time I visited with you all, pre-COVID, boy, it was just about to get us, wasn't it? December 2019. Yes. Had no idea. Um, I, you guys were such a, an amazingly uh, interactive group that I only got through like the first third of my talk <laughs> because you all were asking such great questions and we just ended up having a conversation. So, um, so what I'm going to do tonight is sort of start over remind, you know, many of you may not have been at that talk. So I want to sort of walk you through sort of the, the background, the, the, the hows and the whys of what we study um, with these birds. And then I'll tell you, I'll give you a couple of examples of some of the studies that we have done and, and are currently going to be doing. Um, and so, yeah, so uh, all of this research is through my lab at Florida Atlantic University, where I work with PhD students, master students, and lots and lots of undergraduates which is really fun. So we are a behavioral ecology and animal communication lab. So what that means is that we want to understand how and why animals do the things that they do. So the how questions have to do with physiology, like how does the behavior work? How does the behavior get regulated in the, in the, in the animal's body? So it has to do with genes and hormones and muscles and, and neurophysiology and all that kind of good stuff, that, the how questions. Um, but, but even more so, I in my lab was interested in the why questions, right? Why does a particular species ecology um, and evolution shape it to behave the way it behaves now, right? So we look at the behavior in front of us from whatever animal we might be studying, whether it's the enlarged claw wave display of the fiddle of the crab or the, the, the howls of the primate or the dewlap display of the anole or the roar of the red deer or any of these other displays that animals do. Um, all of these are animal communication signals. And so that's the other part of what my lab does. What are these signals? What information is encoded 
in these signals and how is that information transmitted uh, through individuals. And we happen to use songbirds at, uh, for most of this work. So let me unpack this a little bit more when I say um, animal communication and signals. What do I actually mean by that in the context of the scientific approach that we take to study this? So many of the qualities that an individual animal has are not directly perceivable, right? So you take this lovely male warbler here and there are many things that he should want to advertise about himself to potential mates or potential rivals, right? So he might, so signals, where I'm going with this is many of these traits, how good you might be as a mate, how good you might be as a rival, are not directly perceivable just by looking at an individual. And so that's why signals evolve. Signals evolve to reveal these hidden qualities. They evolve of, as ways of indicating qualities about an individual that are not directly perceivable from the outside. So taking for, for example, this, this uh, male warbler, he might want, he should be selected to advertise to potential females that he's smart, right? A female can't land on a branch next to a male and, and, and guess how smart is he? There's no way to, uh, to, to know that just by looking at him. He might be a great father. He might have excellent skills and experience in that area. That's information that a potential female wants to know, that a potential male might need to know about being his rival. He's healthy, right? He has strong genetic stock. He has a strong, healthy, varied immune system. These are the kinds of things that matter to conspecifics, right? Members of the same species. And so signals evolve as ways of encoding this information and transmitting it to other members of the species. And so these are the signals that we see when we talk about animal communication, we're talking about the brilliant plumage and other types of, of body colors that some animals have, right? Songbirds and other just birds in general are known in many cases for their extravagantly bright plumage, the rufous streaking, the bright yellow plumage of this warbler, right? So what these bright colors are encoding, this is a communication signal, this plumage, and it is transmitting information about the qualities of this male, things that otherwise would be hidden to potential mates the song that he sings, right? His ability to learn to sing the local dialect, his ability to perform these songs in a very precise way, that encodes information about his brain quality, about how he was able to learn during that critical window of song learning early in his life. And so all of these different signals are ways of, for animals to transfer information to each other. And so in my lab, we're using communication signals, in particular birdsong and plumage, to study how behavior evolves, right? And we ask three main questions in our pursuit of doing this. The first is what information is contained in the signal, right? A certain type of song, a certain call type, a certain aspect of the plumage coloration. What information is being transferred through that particular song or trait? How do, then the next question, if we can identify that information, how do the signaler and the receiver, the individual receiving that information, benefit from this exchange of information? We would expect that both the signaler and the receiver are getting something out of this exchange of information. And so we'd like to know how each of them benefits from that. And then a third sort of thornier question is, is the information reliable? Right? So to what degree are animals honest about the information that they're transmitting to each other? And if those signals are honest, and I can tell you, spoiler alert, they usually are, how is this reliability enforced? Why don't animals cheat and lie when creating these signals? So that sort of breaks down the kinds of questions that we ask in my lab. And so now I'll just tell you a little bit about one example that we're working on in, in this gorgeous fellow here, which you all know, the Northern Cardinal, which we all have around in our backyards. We happen to study this guy at Treetops Park 
in, uh, in Davie, where our campus is, we're at the FAU Davie campus. And my PhD student, Morgan Slevin, and I are studying this bird, um, all, all aspects of this bird. We have many different projects going on with it. But the one I wanted to tell you about tonight has to do with the bird's tummy. So I'm sure all of you know that all animals, including us, have a, have a number of different microbiomes in and on our bodies. Microbiomes are, are groups, are communities of microbes that live in various parts, various tissues, surfaces inside of our bodies that have important relationships to us. The gut microbiome is very important to our health. And as, as you know, from the whole probiotics explosion over the last you know, 10 years or so, there's lots of people studying the gut microbiome of, of mammals in particular in humans. And we're starting to learn a lot about the gut microbiome. And one of the things that we've figured out um, mainly through studies with mammals like rats and mice and humans is that there is a link between what's going on in the gut microbiome and what's going on in the brain. And this is most certainly a two-way street. Your gut can affect things going on psychologically and things psychologically can affect your gut. And so what we want to know, what we're exploring with the Northern Cardinal is the degree to which this relationship that's being found in mammals can be applied, can shown to be true in wild animals like free ranging wild Northern Cardinals. So one of the things that we know is really important in mediating this relationship between the gut and the brain is stress. And we know that stress can have both direct and indirect effects on the brain and the gut, right? St psychological stressors affect the brain, which can disrupt the gut. And physiological stressors like bugs, pathogens, viruses, bacteria can affect the butt, the butt, the gut and have upstream effects into our brains and disrupt things like attention and ability to focus, right? So we call that dysbiosis, gut brain dysbiosis, when the brain and the gut are no longer talking to each other correctly and working together in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a healthy way. And of course we know that wild animals have lots of stressors in their lives, lots of different kinds of stressors. And so this is one of the things that we're gonna be studying over the next two field seasons with the Northern Cardinal. Number one, just to document the gut microbiome, we're also looking at the oral microbiome, but for the purposes of this, I'm just focusing on the gut. Um, what does the gut microbiome of a wild songbird look like? How does it change over the course of a breeding season or over the course of a year? And importantly, how do external stressors affect the gut? Because if they do, and we can document the ways in which we do, we can start to make inferences about how that might be affecting them cognitively and behaviorally. And so one of the things that uh, Morgan and I are gonna be doing is focusing on whether this gut brain dysbiosis, when we start to see problems happening between the, happening in the gut, if the gut is dysbiotic, do we see that reflected in plumage and in bill color, right? So many of you probably know that the redness, not only of the plumage of the Northern Cardinal, but also the bill color comes from carotenoid pigments. And you probably also know the carotenoid pigments are not something the cardinal can synthesize himself. He has to get them from his food. And you probably know that carotenoid pigments are very important in regulating the immune response. And so what this means is that the brightness, the redness of a male cardinal's, not only the plumage, because they're gonna molt, so that's kind of a static thing. They can't be changing their plumage all the time, but that bill, that vascularized bill and the amount of, of carotenoids that are available to the cardinal because of his immune status, that bill color can change rather dynamically. And so we're gonna be tracking changes in bill color and plumage color across years as we also examine what's going on in the gut and as we examine what's going on with the brain. And for the brain, we're gonna be focusing on song because of course, song learning and singing song is a very cognitive behavior, that, right? So that's where the brain part of this comes in. And so we're hoping that at the end of all of this, we'll be able to have you know, four or five papers 
that, that document this relationship. What does the gut microbiome look like in a cardinal? How does it relate to behavior? How does it relate to other signals like bill color and maybe plumage? And then how does stress impact that? And I can tell you that um, Morgan's first dissertation chapter, uh, which, which he actually did with the zebra finch in the lab, this was sort of our first pilot study of this. Um, we found, we just published in biology letters, that uh, zebra finches with poor microbiomes, poor in health, and, and we can go into what that means when I say a, a messed up microbiome, a, an unhealthy microbiome, those zebra finches perform significantly uh, worse on a series of cognitive puzzles that we give them to solve. So we found a link, a correlation between what's going on in a zebra finch, zebra finch being a songbird, what it was going on in their gut and how they're able to learn and process information. And this was a lab study, but it's a first step towards you know, kind of tackling these questions and taking them out into the field with wild animals. So now let's talk a little bit more about song. And as um, the previous presenter laid out for me nicely, bird song is a dual function signal, right? So why do birds sing? They sing for two reasons. They sing to fight and they sing to flirt, right? So we know that song can be a male, female directed signal. So males are singing to attract mates and not only to attract the females, but to physically stimulate them to yolk up eggs, right? The, the whole reproductive process comes online as the female brain processes that song. So they're using song to attract those females and then stimulate reproduction. At the same time during the breeding season, males are using these same songs to fight. They're using them to establish territorial boundaries and to repel rival males from their territory that they're defending. And they can use song to specifically threaten rival males and what we call these song, song duels, right? We're, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. So I study it, both aspects of, of bird song. I, I study the song in both the male-female courtship context and in the male-male uh, rival context. So many of you know, I'm sure a, a lot of you know um, that um, the majority of songbirds have relatively small and simple vocal repertoires, right? So the song of the white crowned sparrow here, he sings one song type. This male is going to learn one song type during his first year of life, and he's going to sing that song type like that for the rest of his life. Other species like the swamp sparrow here that I spent about a decade studying during my postdoc, um, swamp sparrows have one to four, on average three, song types in their repertoire. And so they're using these relatively small and simple repertoires to fight and to flirt. By contact, contrast, here is the repertoire, the primary song repertoire, meaning the advertisement song repertoire of one male Bachman Sparrow. We found in our population at Jonathan Dickinson, the average is 48 distinct song types, ranging all the way up to 55. And I think we even now have one that sings 58, right? So these birds have enormous repertoires relative to many songbirds. And the question that I want to ask, sort of my career question is, what is all of this for? If a white crowned sparrow only needs one song type to do all of its fighting and flirting, a swamp sparrow needs two or three, why does a Bachman sparrow need 48? What's going on there? How can we explain the evolutionary processes, the selective forces that led to such a large and complex song repertoire. And I think I can play a couple of these for you. You can hear his lovely songs. So that's just the example of what we'll be hearing next week when we kick off our field season at Jonathan Dickinson Park. At this time of year, they're just starting to gear up. So most of the males won't be singing a lot. Over the next three weeks, we're really gonna ramp up and pretty soon there's gonna be hundreds of males out there singing. Something you might've noticed when I was playing that to you is that um, unlike many songbirds, Bachman sparrows sing with what's called immediate variety. 
meaning they'll sing one song and then sing another and then sing another and then sing another. And they move through their repertoire like that. And that's in contrast to birds like the cardinal that sing with eventual variety, meaning he might sing his first song type 20 times and then switch to the second song type and sing that 25 times and then switch to the next song, right? So it's a very different way of advertising your repertoire, right? So we'd also like to know why Bachman sparrows sing with immediate variety. And so, but it's actually worse than that. It's not only this enormous primary song repertoire that they have, they have other aspects, other singing behaviors that they do um, that's relevant to this. So here's the primary, here's a, an example of a primary song. And here's another primary song. Um, and these are pretty loud. So I'm estimating that they're singing at roughly 85 to 90 decibels out there in the field when they're doing it. This is advertisement song, right? As, as loud as they, they can do it. But they can also, and will also take these same song types and sing them very quietly. They don't tend to change the structure of the song. They just whisper it instead of yell it. And we call that whisper song. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. So what's going on there? What's all this amplitude adjustment about? Then they sing this mess, this disaster, which I think I told you guys a little bit about last time. This in acoustic structure does not really resemble primary song at all. Let's see if I can play the, these two different modes of singing for you. So two good primary songs as opposed to this. We call that warble song because it's very warbly um, and it doesn't really, again, sound much at all like um, these primary songs. I'm gonna bring this screen back. There we go, okay. Um, and of course, like all birds, they have lots of little chip and pick calls that they make, right? So all of this is going on in the Bachman Sparrow vocal repertoire. And what we wanna know is what is all of this for? What are they doing with this? And what are the selective forces from this bird's ecology and social system that have led to this kind of diversity? And we know a kind of, we already know something from the last you know, hundred years of studying bird song about why these elaborate vocal repertoires sometimes evolve. One primary hypothesis is that song is an ornament. Right, males again, they're using song to attract females and stimulate them for mating. And so in some cases, having a huge repertoire is kind of analogous to the peacock's enormous train, right? The, the more the eye spots on the male's train, the more sexy he is and the more females are likely to, to mate with him perhaps, right? And so we know that we were, the, the hypothesis is that song functions in much the same way. In some species, females prefer bigger, more showier. And so males have evolved much larger repertoires as a way, of, as an ornament, as a way of showing off to the females. The other major hypothesis to explain why some birds evolve these really um, complicated and elaborate repertoires is in this context of male-male territorial disputes and, and rivalry, right? So here, song is functioning as a get out or a threat signal. And the, the information contained in the song in this context is stuff like aggressive motivation, how willing is an individual to escalate the fight to the next stage or to bring it to actual physical aggression and intentions, right? So motivation and intentions in regard to aggressiveness is a way that, that this can play out, right? And so males do this to counter singing, intense and counter singing at this time of year, right? When they're setting up their territories and agreeing upon where the boundaries are gonna be between those two territories. And one thing that we know that uh, songbirds do, including the song sparrows and swamp sparrows that I studied for quite a lot, is something called song type matching. So if two males share the same song types, if some of their repertoire overlaps, then they can perform song type matching during these contests. And in some species, song type matching has been shown 
to be a, a step in a hierarchical signaling system towards escalating that context, right? So by performing a match, if your rival sings song type A and you sing song type A right back, that's a way of directing that signal to a specific individual. And that's a way in some species to escalate that to, to a signal that the individual is willing and motivated to take this aggressive interaction to the next step, right? So just one of these examples. So all the kinds of behaviors that we see Bachman sparrows doing in the field when we're studying them, song type matching, they change the rate at which they sing, they switch their song types, they sing more or less, just their song rate in general, they modulate the amplitude. And in some species, although we don't know this for Bachman sparrows, um, males will use rare song types in the context of aggression. Um, so there's all these things that the birds can do with this large repertoire, right, that are clues as to why that bird might need a large repertoire. So we're studying this in Bachman Sparrow because it has this large repertoire and because it does all of these things, and also because it's here in South Florida and we can get our hands on it, right? So um, I'm sure you guys know quite a bit about Bachman Sparrow. It's, it's a species of special concern throughout most of its range. Its numbers are declining mostly because of habitat loss. They're, they're a longleaf pine forest specialist. They need very specific uh, ecology habitat requirements. They require frequent consistent burns, low intensity burns uh, to maintain the things about their habitat that they can that they need to breed. And so really, you know, if you look at this as the, the sort of traditional range of, of longleaf pine throughout the Southeast and the purple is where it used to be and the red is, is what's left. I got this from a paper that's a few years old now. And so, so th th this bird really doesn't have the habitat that it needs and so its numbers are declining. And so I would very much like to study it uh, before it's gone. Very handsome fellow that they have, they, they often in the breeding season get these bright yellow epaulets on their wings there. It looks like someone took a highlighter, colored it in. So we're studying these guys at Jonathan Dickinson. And one of the main ways that we study the male-male function of song, the fight function of song, is through what we call simulated territorial intrusions, right? And that's, that's just what it sounds like. We go out and we simulate an intrusion by a rival male on a subject male's territory. So we go out, we spend a lot of time catching and banding males so we can identify them. We map their territory so we know generally the size and the shape of those territories and who their neighbors are. And then we'll go out and we'll do one of these intrusions where we put a, a model, a replica of a Bachman and Sparrow and pair that with a playback speaker that plays the songs of, of a rival male of a Bachman and Sparrow. And then, um, yeah, so, so the, 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 um, the speaker goes, we start the trial, the, our intruder starts to sing, and in most cases, the, the owner of that territory comes rocketing in, rocketing in to take care of this intruder who dares to come on his territory and sing. And so then over a course of, of time, we watch what this bird does. We quantify, oh, so usually we have like something about a 15 minute playback period, right? Where the intruder's there and singing. And then we remove the intruder and turn off the speaker and we have a post playback period. And that basically simulates what does is, what is our subject do once the intruder has left, right? And both of those periods give us information about the aggressiveness and how the bird, how the aggressiveness of the bird and how it might be using vocal signals to, com to communicate some different times of, of information. So during these two time periods, we're basically quantifying all singing behaviors. We're recording using our, our parabolic microphones, everything they utter and all of their movements. Um, any visual behaviors they do, and particularly proximity to the, the intruder, because we showed in our 2018 paper with this species that the closer a subject male was to his intruder during this playback period, the more likely he was to attack eventually, right? So proximity is now a, a pretty useful proxy for how aggressive a bird is. And so in this, this um, study I'm going to tell you about right now, just really briefly, our question was, do any of these singing behaviors that I've just been telling you about, and any different parts of the vocal repertoire, predict an actual attack? In other words, are any of those behaviors threats of, of upcoming aggressiveness? 
So song as a threat. And so I'm just gonna, we did a lot in this paper. I'll just skip to the punchline. We analyzed the behaviors one minute leading up to the attack to see, because those are gonna be the ones that are the, the threats, right? So we had eight birds that attacked and we analyzed everything they did and the one minute leading up to an attack. And then we compared that to the same one minute period for 22 of the birds that did not ultimately attack. And the most outstanding result from that comparison was that birds who eventually attacked after that one minute sang significantly fewer primary songs. We're looking at primary songs here, the number of primary songs that he sang. Non-attackers sang a lot of primary songs. Attackers did not sing many primary songs. The reason is because they switched to whispering. The attackers switched to whisper song and did not sing the loud primary song anymore. And so whisper song is a threat. Right, and that was our, uh, our, the main finding, one of the main findings of our 2018 paper. The whisper song is the most reliable signal of attack in Bachman sparrows. And it turns out this shouldn't be so surprising because I and other people have documented the same phenomenon in a number of bird species. This is just a few of them. I think we're up to either nine or 11 species of bird that whisper their threats. And not only that, we held an entire symposium at the Animal Behavior Conference a few years back in which we talked about the fact that all kinds of animals whisper their threats instead of shout them. So there's something about um, wanting to, there's something about, there's some selective force that when we get to the point of signaling our strongest motivation to fight, we do that through a whisper and not through a shout. Right, and so we can kind of think, you know, we can go back to that old, that old quote, uh, sing softly, but carry a big stick, right? Speak softly, but carry a big stick. So in our songbirds, it's sing softly, they carry a big stick. But why whisper to threaten a rival? Does anyone wanna give a hypothesis? And if you heard me talk about this last time, then don't. <laughs> don't give it away. <laughs> why, why whisper? Why do we see evolution in so many cases creating communication systems where whispers are the threat? Well, I'll, I'll skip to the, I'll skip to the, the punchline. So we have to remember well, I'll remind you that when I was talking to you before and throughout most of this talk, I've been talking about song in a dyad, right? From signaler to receiver, and then the receiver becomes a signaler and responds. But what we have to remember is there are lots of other individuals out there who can listen to this exchange and extract information that benefits them. One um, very prominent version of this would be predators. I have seen it happen. I, where two songbirds will be engaged in a counter singing interaction and out of a tree will come a peregrine falcon or a cooper's hawk and pick one of them off because they're distracted. And if, a, if the falcon can hear this counter singing, they can use that like a McDonald's whistle, right? Like they can use that information for, for predation. And then also you've got other conspecifics in the area that are listening to this and can extract information as well. So for example, a male's female can listen to him having these disputes between his various neighbors. And if a female, and we know this from a number of studies that have been published over the last 20 years, if a female hears her, her social mate consistently lose in these fights, she will go have extra pair of copulations, right? She finds herself mated to a loser, so she goes out and gets extra pair of copulations. If a rival male, a neighbor, hears a male consistently losing these, these fights, he might be motivated to try and take away some of that territory. So both, so the eavesdropping effect is one explanation for why we might see individuals making this exchange private once it becomes very escalated and, and likely to lead to a fight. So anyway, one of the things that's come out of our, of our Bachman Sparrow work um, and then I'll just tell you the last thing I'll end with here is some, some other aspects of song repertoire use in our Bachman sparrows. And for this, we're doing sort of a, 
a, a um, East Coast comparison. So my friend, Jill Soha, former collaborator, current collaborator um, up at Duke University is studying a population of Bachman sparrows up there. And I'm doing a parallel study of our Bachman sparrows down here in South Florida. So kind of straddling the Northern and Southern um, ends of their range. So one of the things that we're very interested in is that song types in several songbird species, more and more as we're having the technology now to actually find this, is that their song types are not sung at random, but rather they're sung in predictable sequences. One of the earlier papers to uh, bring this to everyone's attention was in Casson's Vario, but Richard Headley published this. And so here is the phrase number in this Vario. And this is, I can move this screen out of the way, there we go. Um, this is the position in the sequence, right? So song, so he, he sings phrase one twice, and then the next one, and then the next one, and the next one he sings four times and then up, right? And so he's stepping through his repertoire and then he starts over again. And what I think you can see is that there are some consistencies with which he always sings certain song types together in a predictable sequence. So this was very interesting to us. We've started analyzing this in our sparrows and lo and behold, they appear to be doing the same thing. So again, here's the song type the number for, for a given bird. This bird uh, goes up to about, I think if I can see this, yeah, up to about 48 maybe that is. So here he's stepping through his whole repertoire. And hopefully what you can see is that there are certain sequences of song types that he always sings together in the same order. And so we're calling this song type sequencing or uh, preferred transitions among song types. And what we would say at this point in our analysis for Bachman sparrows is that their song types are not, they're not sung, the, the, the sequence that they sing them in are neither random, they are not singing their repertoire at random, but not, neither is it rigidly fixed, right? They don't go from song type one to song type 48 in that order every time. Rather, there are subunits within the repertoire that they appear to sing in a predictable order more or less, right? So what I'm showing you here is, a, is actually a so, social network analysis, right? Applied to bird song. So most of our song types, what we find, found through a first pass at this looking at both our North Carolina birds and our Florida birds, is that most of the song types they sing, 92% on average, are followed by another particular type much more often than would be expected by chance. Right? And so one way to look at this on this particular screen here is that the darker arrows, the thicker arrows, connect songs sung in the same order and the more tangled looking sections are songs that are that are sort of they don't they don't come at any particular point in the repertoire right so you can see that for this bird 48 is most often followed by 7 8 9 11 12 60 13 14 16 15 right so and in particular the transition between 15 and 49 and 49 and 17 and 17 and 18 and on and on is really strong Right? You can start to predict that sequence as they move through their repertoires. And this has all kinds of interesting implications, not just for why might this be, is there any adaptive value to singing this way, but it also might provide us some insights into how songs are stored in the song learning system and that vocal system in their brains. And so ultimately we would like to apply these sorts of observations to some neurophysio neurophysiological studies uh, to see if it sheds light on how songbird brains are, are organized. So, and I'll end here just by telling you a little bit about the study that we've got coming up this season at Jonathan Dickinson. We're gonna get out there next Tuesday will be the first day of our field season. We, we working all the way through until July. So um, one idea that we have about a potential adaptive function for having these preferred transitions, these sequences in repertoires is that it might aid in, in individual identification, right? So imagine a male Bachman Sparrow out at Jonathan Dickinson. He's got his territory that he's defending and he has somewhere between three and six or even seven adjacent neighbors all around him. And it's almost certain that these birds come to know each other, 
right? Because they're having all these disputes early on in the season and they have to determine, they have to settle on, agree upon where the boundaries are going to be. And when that happens, it's really apparent out in the field. I can tell you stories about how, you know, they'll de they will decide that this bush is the dividing line, right? It's really, it's really fun to watch that happen. So they make these agreements about where the, where the borders are. Well, part of being able to do that is being able to recognize each other by song. We know songbirds do this, very important. But how do they do this with such an enormous repertoire? So we've got Joe here and he's singing, he's got 45 song types and here's his neighbor over here with 50 and the neighbor over there has got 39 and the neighbor over there has got 46 and they're singing through these song types fast, fast, fast. How could you ever use song as a marker, as an, as an individual identifier? And so this is where we think sequences might come in, right? Both of these birds have these enormous repertoires. But if Joe over here always sings this sequence when he's going through his repertoire, and this guy over here always sings this sequence, then you can, then that could help individuals with these enormous repertoires learn to keep track of each other. And the way we came upon this, um, this hypothesis is because our brains do this. We found ourselves over the past six years of studying this bird, learning orally to identify our birds before ever putting glasses on them and seeing their color band combinations because we learn to recognize the sequence. If our brains can do that, I'm guessing a Bachman Sparrow brain can do that too. And so we've got a playback experiment uh, planned for this spring to test this idea. And I think Oh yeah, so song sequences might be um, enabling neighbor recognition and, and dis discrimination amongst neighbors. So for, with that, my time is up. I wanna thank you for, uh, for listening and I would be happy to take any of your questions about any of this nonsense I just told you about. There we go. So I uh, thank you so much, Rindy. Uh, I wanted to say uh, your students are right. You're engaging, you're exciting, and you make the study of animal behavior interesting. I totally right. agree with them. So uh, do we have any questions for Dr. Anderson? Uh, so uh, some are starting to come in. Are Bachman's singing now? Yes. Um, I, I've been talking to the biologist up at the park uh, I always email him about this time of year, like, hey, don't forget, we're coming to study your birds. And he's like, hey, they're singing for you. Come on up. So yes, they're, they're singing now. Um, it's, it, they're they're going to be ramping up, right? So right now you'll have this one over here and this one over there that might sing at the right time of the morning, but give them a month and they'll, they'll all be going blazes. So for the birders of us, uh... <laughs> I, this is really a bad question. Which songs might they be singing? <laughs> All, <laughs> of <them. laughs> All of them. All of them, yeah. And, and you know, it's interesting. There's been a couple of papers published in the last 10 years or so um, that document individual male Bachman sparrows singing other species, right? So um, I think there was one Bachman sparrow that was singing very much Carolina Wren song. Um, and then there was another Bachman Sparrow that was singing, God, it just came out, what the heck was it? But it, anyway, it was, it was, so they sort of even have this mimicry property to them apparently, which I think um, might be a byproduct of having a brain that just sucks in songs, right? So every once in a while, an accidental non-conspecific non gets sucked in there too. That is so wonderful. Uh, so um, more questions. Um, uh, do birds have a regional dialect? This is Marianne Gable asking, do birds have a regional dialect? Yeah, in just about every species of songbird that's been studied, we see pretty pronounced regional dialects. And usually the way you can tell that is you can take, so for example, and this is something we probably won't do this year, but next year, um, if I take Jill's North Carolina Bachman songs and play them to my birds, they are not going to respond the same to them. They can absolutely tell the difference between wow. a Florida bird and something not Florida, 
right? And there's lots of reasons that we think they care. And, and not only the males notice, but the females really notice and they do not like the foreign dialect. They will strongly discriminate against a male that doesn't sing good old local song. Yeah, so good question. Wonderful. Um, Chris Golia asks, so what's the most unusual behavior? Uh, I, I'm assuming bird behavior, not in your husband or students. <laughs> what's the most unusual behavior you have observed? Oh boy. Do I have any great stories? Well, so <laughs> I should I should have the video for you. Um, so we have some good video of attacks happening in the field, right? So animals try really hard not to fight each other because fighting is really dangerous. One of the things I did notice when I was working at Duke one day is I found two chickadees that had been fighting and they were so vicious, they had dug into each other's pectoral muscles and they were attached, wow. right? Each one had dug its talons into the pectoral muscle of the other and they were just spinning around on the ground. And I had to pull them apart, <laughs> right? So vicious. And the other thing we find is that they go directly for the eyes, right? So we have these taxidermic mounts of birds that we put out to study this attack behavior. And you'll get a bird that will come in, land on the back of another bird, and just spend the next 10 minutes trying to remove the eyes. Like they just, they go right, they go right for it. Um, so, so that's pretty fun. I've studied um, wing waving behavior in swamp sparrows. I have a paper about that um, on my website where we built a robotic swamp sparrow in order to study this wing waving behavior that they, that they do. It's crazy. You can look it up. If you, if you Google swamp sparrow wing waving, you're probably going to get to videos I've posted on, <laughs> on YouTube or whatever, but they do this crazy like thing, right? And it's very much a male, male directed um, visual signal. And they pair that with a whisper song. That looks ridiculous in the field. And then something that we've just noticed our Bachman sparrows do, I mean, none of this is super bizarre. It's just like animal behavior, but it's hilarious when you see it. Um, our Bachman sparrows sometimes do this crazy dance where two males will get right next to each other on a branch and they'll do like a, <laughs> right? And they do it in a duet, you know, like ducks sometimes do, like one goes down, the other one goes up. It's like some kind of like assessment behavior that they're doing. And we just saw it out of the blue one day. And I think I fell on the ground laughing. It was like the funniest thing I've ever seen because there's this beautiful little songbird and they're singing, they're singing. And then they land in front of each other and they just start doing this bizarre threat dance. So anyway, there's just a few examples. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Uh, so there's a, a question here about where in Jonathan Dickinson Park um, is the, this is from Joe uh, Libertucci. Uh, what part of the park is it best for seeing the sparrows? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, we, when we meet in the field, we always park down close to the education center. If you know that park at all, there's a big, lovely education center sort of down at the end of the long winding road. What do they call that? The, uh, I forget what, it's one of the main roads into the park. You just follow the signs for the education center. Big giant parking lot down there. Pretty much all around there is one of the main field sites that we use, right? And so if you just sort of look out into the, you know, into the into the pine flatwoods around there, um, you're gonna you're gonna see you're gonna hear them. You're gonna hear them before you see them. They're really hard to see. They're like one of these little mouse birds that runs around the ground, right? And so we really can only study the males. I you never see the females. We accidentally catch them sometimes because they'll follow a male into a net. Um, we can fire the males up with a little bit of song playback and they'll go up into the top of a tree and just sing and sing and sing and sing and sing and sing and sing for 45 minutes without stopping. So, um, you know, come out with us in the field sometime. I'll show you three dozen Bachman sparrows. <laughs> so so uh, uh, to that point, I'm just wondering, how long do you guys spend in the field when you go out there doing your research? Is it like all day? Is it? It's, it's not because um, the birds really shut down at about 11 a.m., it gets so hot, you, you can't imagine. I mean, one of the things that, that I think is really interesting about Bachman sparrows and that we're trying to get some grant money to study is here's a species at the southern end of its range that is being punched in the face by, by global warming, by climate change. Every I've only been out there six years 
every year it is worse and not just the heat but the humidity so these birds are having to do all of their work the hard work the breeding the tear carrying of young the fighting each other the flying around the singing in temperatures that you can't imagine and so we can't take it <laughs> you know what i mean by 10 30 11 we're dehydrated and about to pass out and so and and i don't want to i don't want to press the birds beyond beyond that time so we try to get out there around 6 30 or 7 and we're done usually by 10 or 10 30. so everybody you hear that from about 6 30 to 7 to about 10 30 if you're interested in volunteering with Renee, right? <laughs> uh, that's that's the schedule okay that's right. And we're not out there seven days a week. So email me if you want to come out one time. I'll tell you which days we're going to be out there that week. So another question. First of all, they say excellent presentation. Thank you. Do you notice sequence or amplitude changes when the males sing near the edges of their territories? And this is from Robin Diaz. Yeah, so isn't that a great question? I wish I knew. Um, we know that they definitely change amplitude when they're in an escalated aggressive interaction. So you, you'll often see that if, you're, if you happen to be standing on the border between two territories and you know two males will be singing, 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 and then they'll start to do a little song type matching. And then all of a sudden they both come and now they're within 20 feet of each other. They will often switch to whisper song and start singing to each other quietly from, from that um, boundary. So certainly amplitude. Um, they will often start singing faster, right, during that. And, and that could just be a general, I'm amped up, I'm about ready to fight sort of thing, or there could be a message contained in that increased song rate, I don't know. Something I'm really interested in is this idea that, that males reserve some small part of their repertoire specifically for these interactions, or maybe they reserve, so we call them rare song types, and we're gonna be doing a playback experiment this summer to test that idea. And, and, it, and it could be those rare song types are used primarily in a male-male rivalry context, but who knows, they might have a set of song types that they use when they're courting the females too. So that's something that it, it's gonna take us a decade to figure that out, but <laughs> we're certainly studying it. <laughs> wow, uh, so just some comments. Uh, Lauren Butcher, fascinating, thank you. How big are their territories out at JD? Boy, it really varies. There's, a, as you know, out there, um, there's a lot of um, natural boundaries like trails and roads. And then there's a lot of water. There's a lot of standing water, these seasonal ponds that, and all of that stuff sort of cuts up the landscape. So sometimes you'll have territories that are a few hectares. And then sometimes you'll have these enormous territories. I mean, nothing like a Swainson's Warbler, right? But, um, you know, one way to think about it is if you're standing in a pretty dense area of, of Bachman sparrows, you might hear five different males singing. You can just, you know, just, wow. you'll be able to hear them. So they're that, I think of them as being relatively spread out relative to like a song sparrow. You know, they can be really packed in there um, or a cardinal even can be like backyard, backyard, backyard. So they're much bigger than that, but but nothing on the scale of Swainson's Warbler. So just some comments now. Uh, Fred Quinn says, very interesting talk, great conclusions to random, to random data. Uh, uh, Daniel and Ellen Averbook say it was so fascinating and thanks so much. Uh, Susan Young says, great presentation, thank you. Uh, Shelley Rosenberg uh, says, wonderful presentations. I photographed the Bachmans at uh, John D. Uh, State Park and now I understand the band I've noticed. Yes. So that's great, that's great. Awesome. And Chris, and Chris Golia says, love the stories, uh, thanks. So um, that's all I have for the comments. Great. I wanna thank you so much for joining us this evening. Those, your, your research is amazing. amazing. Thank you. And it's just wonderful hearing what, you're, what some of the conclusions that you're coming to based on the studies you're doing here locally, which is really locally. exciting. Yeah. Right here in South I, Florida, yeah. Come out and join us sometimes. We're gonna try to get quite a big citizen science thing going on with our Bachman sparrows, you know, up there. So, you know, there are certainly opportunities to get involved if folks want to. So if you share that with me, I will share that with our membership. And I'm yeah. sure you'll get at least a couple of hardy volunteers out there in those warm months 
to yeah. uh, can handle that heat and are, right. are, we'll help you guys out. Okay, awesome. well, thank you so much, Dr. Rindy Anderson. I hope you, you can come back some time with some new research. I'll, I'll be excited to hear it and I'm sure our members will as well and have a wonderful evening. Thank you, thanks again Absolutely. For tonight. Thank you so much. Okay, you take care. Good night, everybody. All right, let me just share my screen. Okay, uh, and uh, let's see what screen comes on now. I'm, I don't even know anymore. Uh, so, uh, uh, we're, we're, we're just about done with another evening tonight. I wanted to let you know we'll be meeting again on Tuesday, April 6th at 7 p.m. when once again, not Ron, but Ron McGill, Zoo Miami protecting the Harpy Eagle will be presenting. Uh, thank you so much for coming out tonight. I hope you learned a lot, enjoyed yourself, uh, got to see some of your fellow Audubon Everglades uh, members, and we hope to see you again on April 6th at 7 p.m. So happy birding, get out there. Uh, the weather is warm and getting warmer, but the birds are definitely around and they are there for us to study like Dr. Anderson does and to enjoy as we do as, as, as birders. Thanks again, have a great night and see you all next month.